Welcome back to Enolates. I am excited to introduce this next part to you. Uh, as you can see from the name, Enolate alkylation, that's exactly what we're going to do next. Alkylation means we are making a carbon bond to the enolate. That's exactly what we're hoping it would do because enolates are carbon nucleophiles. So this is part of what we've been building up to. Um, but we're nowhere near the, the end of the home stretch here, um, and these are very useful reactions. So um, that's why I have a smile on my face. I like this chapter and the next one. So uh, what is happening here in nutshell is it's actually pretty simple, but um, you know you don't want to get tripped up. There's a little there's a lot of complexity hidden in that elegant simplicity, like a lot of chemistry, right? So um, step one, we have our base, and we're going to have some bases that we need to recognize are good for this job, for, for making enolates. So we'll get to that soon, and don't worry, it's not usually much of a surprise. Um, our job is to take that alpha H off. We've made our enolate. Step two, we add our electrophile, because we've made a nucleophile. Good old-fashioned alkyl halide. SN2 goes back to that, right? Attack, kick off new group added is a carbon containing group so um, our group our prime so voila pretty exciting right so um i'll just kind of highlight that big piece all right so that is a big deal let's look at that with a real defined r group okay let's take a cyclohexanone, cyclic ketone, and LDA. That's a real popular base for this purpose. LDA. What is LDA? LDA is lithium diisopropyl amide. I've used LDA before, but I don't remember um, if we've taken some time to write it out and spell it out, so I'm going to do that here. Lithium di isopropyl amide or amide depending on how you pronounce it okay let's underline that acronym l d a so we could see the diisopropyl see the lithium and the amide or the amide um, indicates that it's a negatively charged nitrogen okay so that is a you might say why isn't it a nucleophile because all bases can be nucleophiles it's because it's so bulky so it makes a very poor nucleophile and so um and it's also negative charge on ends makes a very good base so very basic ready to pick up a an h and there it goes the alpha h is the most acidic so let's do the enolate that way We have our lone pair here. All right, then we introduce step two, our alkyl halide. This is nothing more than an SN2. So backside attack, kick it off. So, you know, usual SN2 rules. We like primary or secondary alkyl halides, not too much steric hindrance. However, if that alkyl halide has a stereo center, watch out, it's inverted. I mean, we've seen that a lot. So just kind of keep that in mind. All those old rules apply. Um, but that's exciting, right? Because we look at, we get that new group there. So we get that ethyl installed right there. It's always that alpha carbon though. You can't just put it anywhere on that ring. Only that alpha carbon was acidic. So you could only take the H off the alpha carbon. So there must've been an alpha H. So I'm just gonna write alpha there and I'll write alkylated at alpha C. All right. Now, notice some other reaction conditions we have here. We have THF. What is THF? We've seen THF before. Tetrahydrofuran. It's a solvent. So it's a cyclic ether, right? Um, it stabilizes our enolate and our nucleophile. Um, what else do we have here that we want to look at? <laughs> Temperature was specified. Look at how cold it was. Negative 78 degrees Celsius. 
Um, that's going to be something we look into a little more detail later. Don't worry. Okay, reaction of the second step was SN2. And our enolate was our nucleophiles. These are all things I said out loud, but I want to make sure I got a chance to write it. So um, let's do some more reaction sequences and switch up the substrate to see what variety it might look like. So remember, nitriles have really similar reactivity to carbonyls. So because of that dipole, the alpha carbon to a nitrile is also acidic. So LDA would take off the alpha to a nitrile carbon as well. So anything we're doing here can also throw in, remember the nitriles were kind of like the weird cousin of the carbonyls, but that does work. All right, so put a little negative uh, charge there. Now we have a carbon nucleophile again and behaves much like the enolate. We can make that carbon-carbon bond. So we can also alkylate nitriles. So our new group is the methyl. So we get the T-butyl nitrile. What else could we do? Does it have to be aldehyde or ketone? Well, it has to have an alpha H. So this is an ester, but it does happen to have an alpha H. Okay, so we can take that H off one of them. And it can attack. We have our nucleophile. So be prepared to work with lots of different looking compounds. And that's just always why it doesn't help to do anything other than practice loads and loads of problems. So you get used to seeing a pattern emerge from lots of different looking ones, right? That's when the similarity ironically starts to show up. Okay, now here is where the complexity enters the scene. That was actually relatively simple. An acid-base reaction followed by an SN2, that's not really anything new because we're just combining two things we know. But there are considerations to make and um, the, the, the result is a big deal. It's a carbon-carbon bond. So yes, it's worth noting separately on its own merit. Um, but when we have different looking compounds where there's more than one alpha carbon and those two alpha carbons are not equal, therefore their two alpha protons are not equal, how do we know which one will come off? Let's draw all the alpha carbons on this one for a case in point and I'm going to color code them. Let's do this one on the left red or the top side red and over here blue. So this is our starting material. If a base pulls off the red, I'm going to draw a red product. So here's my enolate. I'm going to draw the actual enolate, the alkene alcohol that's negative. And where did my, there's my methyl still there left alone. All right. Plus, what if I take off the blue proton instead? Now let's look at the actual enolate. So the O would be here like that, but the CC double bond would be on the other side and the methyl would be part of that. Okay, let's write out some features that distinguish these two products because that's going to indicate to us which might be more preferred to form. All right, so if we have the red product, we have an H on the enolate, but we have no H on the blue enolate. So we would describe this as a tri substituted. There's four different groups that are not, or excuse me, three different groups that are not H. Tri substituted alkene. And this would be a Tetra, there's no H on there. So all four groups on that alkene are not H's. Tetra substituted. So we know from our previous understanding of alkenes that Zeitz's rule says that the more substituted alkene is favored. So the blue one so far would be more stable. 
Okay. However, look at our starting material. What if our base was LDA, bulky? This is a hard H to get to, whereas this is easier. So then red would be favored. So let's consider all those factors and put it together. Okay, so we did that step. We drew the enolate as the enolate, the um, negatively charged oxygen. The one that's the most stable is the blue. Tetra substituted alkene. Why? So we're going to call that the thermodynamic product. It's the more stable product. Which one would form the fastest? That's where the bulkiness comes into play. So go back to here. The blue one's wedged next to a methyl, and if you draw out all those H's on a methyl, if you have a bulky base, that's hard to get to. This is much more accessible. Red will form much faster than the blue. So the less substituted. less steric hindrance. We call that the kinetic product. So there's a competition going on. Which one's easier to form? Which one's better to form? All right, let's make a plot. Pictures worth a thousand words, as they say, and I believe the same thing with an energy plot. We can get a lot of information. Um, in fact, I like sketching a mini one of these every time I have to think about it because it's really that useful. So when we're doing a reaction profile, remember our starting material was the same thing in each case. So it's starting at the same point. So in other words, that was our starting material right here. We have two different products. So I'll have a red level and a blue level. The blue level is lower energy than the red level. So let's do that. Uh, blue is going to be down here, and I'll call that thermodynamic product. And then the red, I'll just arbitrarily, you know, make it higher. I'm not doing this quantitatively where I measure it, but it's a concept we're trying to get down. Kinetic product. Okay, so now. We have to think about that addresses the stability. Now we have to get over the transition state. Whose transition state is lower? That's with that addresses who's easier to attack. So the lower one is easier to attack. Red is easier to, to attack. Red's lower. So this is T S kinetic. This is T S thermo. All right, so thermo is harder to attack, so it's going to be harder to start and initiate the reaction, easier to finish because you have a lower energy downhill. Let's connect the dots. All right, here we go. Connect the dots. There we go, that's the blue path and the red path. And so we can get lots of information from here. You see the difference in activation energy. EAT versus EAK, right? The overall idea here is that one is easier or better than the other at different points in the process. We can exploit that to favor one over the other. And that's the powerful part. That's the best part because we don't really care that this one 
is better. It's not like a morality thing. <laughs> They're amoral molecules. It's more that um, stability, the, the lower energy of it allows us to isolate it if we are able to overcome the fact that it's harder to form. If we were to make it, if we were to find a way to make it easier to form, smaller base, right? Maybe cut down on the stair hindrance here, then um, it can be more feasible. Here, this one is not so desirable to form in the end, but if we can make it more desirable to form faster, then we could eliminate this product. So the idea is that we want the control as chemists. We're not just sitting here judging which one's better. We want to control which one we want at the time and have that selectivity so we can engineer our path to our synthesis that we, we want. So we want to design that, right? So let's um, think about ways we can have that control. So we're all about having the control uh, so we can use them as tools in a synthetic plan. And what I'm going to do is just kind of summarize which one I want here, which enolate I want. So I want this one, I'm going to do in red words, kinetic versus this one that I had drawn in blue earlier, which is my thermodynamic product. And notice I'm drawing the enolate the other way, right? Uh, so if that's confusing you, remember that's this guy. I hope it's not by now because I want you to be comfortable with both. Right? The more substituted one. And that's the same as this one. Uh, where were we? Right there. Okay. So how can we make sure, let's say we want the red guy. How can we make sure we get that one? It's not the most stable product, but we, it's the easiest one to form. That's what we home in on. Target the fact that it's the easiest to form. So, easiest to form means it reacts faster. It, it's the first one to react. It's easier to access. So, faster reaction means more reactive. So you want a very strong base. In other words, because it reacts quickly. If it's not a strong base, a weak base would react slowly, be more discriminant about what um, H it's going to select. We don't want that. We also want a base that's bulky because if it's bulky, it's less likely to take that H off. That's the H we wanted to take off, right? Because that would do what we call amplify because it's already hindered. But if not only is the site hindered, the base is hindered, then we've amplified the hindrance. So LDA does the job with that. LDA is a favorite bulky base. Solvents that help with that. Needs to be polar because if we have a strong base, we have to dissolve that and plus our enolate is forming. We need it to, to dissolve right away as it forms. It's an anion. So dissolve enolate. We also need it to be aprotic because if it's protic we get an equilibrium which just slows everything down. Okay so so far so good right? So THF. So remember those conditions we saw earlier over the arrow they're starting to kind of pan out as to why we had to choose those. So for this reaction, we need conditions. So it will, it'll dictate the outcome. There was a third condition you might remember, temperature. If we want to make sure that we don't get the thermodynamic product, we need to make sure we only access, in other words, this energy level and not this one. So if we think about how much heat this one requires, this requires more heat. So we need to add just enough heat that this reaction will happen, but not that one. So that usually means whatever it is, this is lower temperature than that one. This is usually cold. This is often room temperature, RT. So not necessarily hot or heat. It might say heat or hot, 
um, or actually have a hot temperature given, but it might even just say RT or give a room temperature and you don't think of that as hot. It's relative though, right? If you see two side by side and one's hotter than the other, the hotter one is the thermodynamic, the colder one's the kinetic. So how do we control the energy? Make sure you do not make it too hot because you have to get the lower activation level. So own, that'll allow you to only overcome the first activation energy. The common temperature we'll see is negative 78 degrees Celsius because that's an easy, practical, um, driest bath to achieve. Okay. That helps us get the red path. Let's suppose we really want the blue one. We want that sterically hindered site. Can't use a bulky base. It has a higher activation energy. Can't use cold temperature, need hot temperature, right? We can kind of think of those opposites or what we need. Let's, let's, let's flush that out. So instead of a strong base, we're gonna want a, a, a smaller base that's usually still pretty strong, but doesn't have to be, it's not quite as important. So I'm gonna say smaller base. Our favorites are usually gonna be the alkoxides. So like ETO minus, or even, even this um, T-butoxide, we're used to thinking that is bulky. It's small enough. It's not branched out in two ways. So don't let that deter you. It's just got, it's got, it's, it's practically linear for the sake of this one with oxide. So when you see an alkoxide, still kind of keep it in that family unless it's really ridiculously big. Nitrogen, however, because it makes three bonds, it has one for the anion lone pair and then it has the two groups coming out. Um, that's why it makes it so sterically hindered. Okay, what solvent would be good? Still need polar, no matter what, because we have an enolate to dissolve. But this time we will want protic. Because we are gonna get the more stable product, we wanna slow down the reaction to have an equilibrium because if you have a slower reaction, um, you know, it kind of gets to get a chance to funnel toward the lower energy well. So let's see, creates equilibrium. And the equilibrium will eventually favor the lower energy product. Okay, energy of reaction. High temperature to get over that big blue hump right there, okay? That means we need to overcome both activation energies. So it might say delta or RT or room temp, which is around 22 degrees Celsius. You have to get overcome both activation energies. Okay. Hope that makes sense. Let's put that in action and see what that looks like over the arrows. Okay, so here's our friend again that's asymmetrically substituted. We have two alpha carbons, alpha, alpha one and two. Notice that we have LDA, bulky base, THF, protic apolar solvent, cold, negative 78 degrees Celsius. Okay, slow reaction means only first act, uh, activation energy overcome with the cold temperature. Bulky base also means we're not going for the most substituted. This is our preferred enolate. So you can draw it either way. I notice students typically like to draw the anion on the carbon instead of the oxygen for this one, just because they're working out where the anion goes, um, which proton came off. And then it makes this step clear as well. Now we're ready to use that enolate as a nucleophile, SN2. Kind of home free from there, right? So we can get the ethyl on that side and a methyl on the other. But what if we want the ethyl and methyl on the same carbon? Then, so this is the, uh, excuse me, the kinetically controlled. We want the thermodynamic version. So good old kinetics versus thermodynamics. So 
this H versus this H. So this one, it, we took off that one. But with thermodynamics, we're always going to take off the most substituted. Right? Why? Alkoxide, smaller, hotter. So we can overcome both activation energies. Right? Notice the product solvent establishes equilibrium. All things that favor the thermodynamic product. More substituted anion forms. Time for our SN2. Alkylation on an alpha carbon, but this time it was the other alpha carbon. So this was our thermodynamic enolate um, product. This is our kinetic product. Think about the fact that we used to have two H's actually here. So it was not a stereocenter, but we traded an H for an R group. So now it is. And there's only one H there, but um, that would have been a stereocenter likely to begin with. But it still is now, whether it's defined or not. All right. So. I hope that the thermodynamics versus kinetics is making sense so far. We are going to use a very specific application of enolate alkylation in the next example. So thermodynamics versus kinetics will tell us which alpha carbon gets it. But we're going to move on to another application that has the use of the malonic ester synthesis. And actually what I'll do is I'll tell you the application of malonic esters. So there are good precursors with the addition of urea for barbiturate synthesis. So that's why you're going to learn this really highly specialized synthetic series of steps. So it's a big, uh, well-known series of steps for pharmaceutical industry. There's actually two such syntheses in your book. So the acetoacetic ester synthesis and same with the malonic ester synthesis. So diethylmalonate is what we um, start with. So no, just take a minute to look at it. It's a diester, right? And linking the two ethyl esters is an alpha carbon that they share. And everything happens there. You doubly alkylate it and then you eventually get that to react with urea to cyclize into the barbiturate. That's the, bar that's the native compound for barbiturates. Um, so if we use that little point of disconnection here, let's see, again, right there, we get our other compound back. I brought this up before, but uh, interesting history of barbiturates. They're named after, um, legend has it, named after Barbara by Adolf von Bayer, who would have tipped his green hat at this, uh, at this molecule. So are you ready to make some barbiturate precursors? All right, I suspect so. I'm gonna get this up out of here. Malonic esters. We're going to use what we know about the enolate alkylation to doubly alkylate that shared alpha H. There we go. So this is the format. Our goal is it's going to look like this when we're done. It's not going to be actually the barbiturate. So we stop one a step short and form this instead. But we start, the, both of them start with diethylmalonate. And look at the series of steps. You go base. I recognize that. That's a thermodynamically favored base. Uh, alkylate once. And then we lose actually an ester, that's hydrolysis. We'll do the mechanism for that. Or base alkylate, base alkylate. So R, R prime, R, R prime, hydrolyze. In both cases, the hydrolysis get, results in a loss of an ester, also means loss of that carbon. So CO2 is driven off at some point, 
You notice the heat there helps promote that. And carboxylic acid on the other side. So in other words, let's just dissect some of this so we can kind of reason through what's going on here before we do the mechanism. I'm gonna count my carbons. One, two, three. Because you're gonna to have to recognize this and be able to draw it, predict it, and it's a little, it's highly specific, as unlike most of the other reactions. When we do other enolate alkylations, you wanna be able to do it with anything. But the malonic ester synthesis is specifically starting with diethylmalonate, which is its own interesting, it's a natural product that derives from uh, malonic acid, which I believe comes from apples. Um, okay, so notice this R prime, excuse me, R gets added here. And then notice also we're, we've lost a carbon. Well, let's find our alpha carbon right there. There's our alpha carbon. And notice we have, that was always carbon two. We're missing carbon one. Right? It went off as CO2 somewhere. So I'll put that as carbon one. Just that's not usually shown because it's CO2 and it's, that's not an interesting product. But we will show it in our mechanism. Okay, I wanna write down what really happened here. So just so we have in words because we're about to do the mechanism that's pretty long. I've broken it down, but it's long nonetheless. Um, R so in red attached to green alpha C from diethylmalonate. So you must start with diethylmalonate. You don't really get a choice. That's what makes it the malonic ester synthesis. That, there's three minimum steps. Or you can make it a five step sequence, but you only do that if you see two new R groups an R and R prime, or they could be the same. R can equal R prime. So if you encounter, hey, I have a carboxylic acid with a new R group, malonic ester synthesis, and I lost a carbon, by the way, um, or I have a carboxylic acid with two new R groups, the longer malonic ester synthesis. So instead of doing base alkylate, you do base alkylate, base alkylate, repeat. Finally, hydrolyze last, okay? So let's write that out. Two R, groups attached to this guy, the alpha, C from the malonic ester. Alrighty. So we are going to abbreviate ET is ethyl. I think we've done that enough. I know I were asked that right there. <laughs> you know what Ethel is. All right. She's married to Fred, right? Lucy's best friend. Okay. Oh, Ethel. All right. Oh, Ethel. <laughs> All right. That's enough. Um, malonic ester synthesis. First step. There's sodium ethoxide sitting there. We're going to use it as a base and form our enolate. All right, here we go. We have only one alpha carbon. That's what all the business happens. How do we form an enolate? Easy, it's an acid-base reaction. Take our proton off. So like I said, instead of making this a big blank page and writing the mechanism, I'm writing out each step as its own thing. Um, but you know, when you practice this, do it either way. Uh, hopefully that clarifies it, but um, some of this stuff we already know. We know how to form an enolate. But it's gonna be a little repetitive, I think, because we're gonna rewrite the product each time. That's kind of the downfall to this approach. So I don't do, I don't, it's not the typical way of writing out a mechanism, because we're about to repeat, uh, rewrite this product. So there's our enolate, okay? Step two, alkylate. Via SN2. So let's draw the product first. Draw my O. Product from previous. Lone pair. Let's draw what that should look like if we alkylate. New group on the alpha carbon. 
What's the new group? I don't know. What's on the halogen? Oh, it's an ethyl. There we go. Attack, kick off. It's SN2. Okay, step three is only applied if you're not going to go on and do um, the second alkylation. Excuse me, the hydrolysis at the end instead. So we can add a second R group or not. So in this case, we are. So second alkylation, second deprotonation to form deprotonation to form second enolate. Here we go. Product of from previous step was the alkylated malonic ester. We're going, but hey, that has one more H to take off. I'm going to take that off. Oh, look at me. I just got in robot mode and I drew it out. Lone pair and there it is. All right. What did that mechanism look like? Once again, good old acid base. Okay, so now once we have an enolate, what do we do? We use it as a nucleophile to attack an electrophile, SN2 style. So second alkylation via SN2. So let's draw the product of our previous step, that enolate we made. All right, now we're going to attack SN2 style. And now we're going to have a methyl on the same carbon as that ethyl we added earlier. Ethyl and methyl. All right, step five. This is where it gets interesting. Hydrolysis of the esters and decarboxylation okay so we're going to draw the product from the previous step are doubly alkylated so i'm drawing the longest sequence possible doubly alkylated instead of singly alkylated, but it doesn't matter, that part was easy. This is actually included in either sequence. The hydrolysis happens no matter what, and it is the hardest part of the mechanism, so it requires the most practice because look how mysterious this is going to look. I hope you appreciate that. We are going to have hydrolyzed one of the esters. That means it's a carboxylic acid now. So see how I did that? This, this is now this. We have our ethyl and our methyl still there, but we lost all of this. It's gone. That's how we, it ultimately became our CO2. How did that happen, right? That is why there's a lot of space here. And that is why I am not going to block a third of it by standing here. I am going to make myself disappear and sit and you should sit if you're not sitting and or maybe take a drink of caffeine or, or water and um, get ready to be really alert while we work through this mechanism, especially the part where we um, decarboxylate. It's fun. I just want to make sure you're ready for uh, give you a heads up that you're, we're in for a good, exciting ride coming up. So. I'm going to give you a second to get ready for that and we'll continue. Okay, that's better. I'm sitting down. I have my water next to me. I'm ready to start a mechanism. 
That will be a good brain workout. And like a good workout, we have two sides to do. <laughs> like if you're gonna do arm curls, you have to do the same thing on both sides, right? So two esters to hydrolyze. And um, before we move on to the decarboxylation step, the big, the big one. So um, you could break it into those three segments, double hydrolysis followed by decarboxylation. So let's show that. And because there's so much to go into, I'm going to simplify the proton transfer steps as much as possible. This is not allowed in a organic one class. So um, this is uh, to separate out all the busy work from the meat of this mechanism. So we're taking the, this for granted. So in other words, um, I don't normally say, OK, I'm going to call this H+. Plus, but we're going to do that because we're trying to save a little bit of time and space. So. Knowing that I have some acid, knowing I have carbonyls, what is gonna happen? Always the same thing, you activate your carbonyl. We know the hydrolysis mechanism, but we're gonna show it anyway, just because it is part of this big picture. So this part is not new. So pick any one of your um, carbonyls and activate it. So in acidic conditions, in the presence of a carbonyl, you activate your carbonyl. That part is the same predictable first step. Why did we activate it? Because it's going to be attacked by nucleophile. Who's our nucleophile? Water. We need to make our carboxylic acid because we're hydrolyzing. Attack. Open. Open to the alcohol. OET is still there. Water and everything attached to it is now bound, so it's positively charged. We want to keep the water and the OH from the water, and we want to get rid of the OET as ethanol because it's not here. So we're going to do a proton transfer, ditch one of these protons so that it can go on there, and that way this is neutralized. H plus transfer. Okay, so keep that OH. Now ethanol has been formed and it is ready to leave. Now in a organic one class, you would let it leave and then we would look at it, decide what to do next, but we know that we need to reform a carbonyl. So we're gonna use that as a driving force to get it to go. Kick that down and to save us some time in the mechanism and kick that off. And here we go. Our carbonyl that we reformed still had nox, a hydrogen on it that we'll have to be dealt with. But look at that, we have our, we're practically with our carboxylic acid. Because we know how to deprotonate, and that's a trivial step, I'm going to just indicate that we know that by not really um, explicitly drawing that part of the mechanism out. Okay, so we've got, that is the end of the first hydrolysis. We hydrolyzed one ester. Now, like any good workout, you got to do the other side. <laughs> so don't you love that? You're doing a workout and you just say, okay, it's time for the other arm. That means you're only halfway done. However, the good thing about this is that we get to say, it's more like a math proof. Hey, I showed that this is true. So if, if this equals that, then this must also equal that. So I could replace it. Basically, it's okay to do this. Um, repeat mechanism. I'll say hydrolysis mechanism just to be really specific. Hydrolysis mechanism for second ester. Okay, so now we have a diacid. That's kind of a turning point in this mechanism. Because notice we have not, we, we have almost what we need for our final product. So this piece needs to go. The green part's not there. So how can we get rid of the green part? This has to leave as CO2. So we gotta work on that. So in order to get that to happen, 
we are going to, I'm going to undo that circle, or you could leave it there if you want, but it's just going to be in my way for this arrow I'm about to draw. I'm going to rotate the bond right there so that I can get that in a six-membered ring transition state. So this bond right here, I'm going to basically grab this and bring it over. So rotate this out of the plane and bring it over here so this H is near this oxygen, and you'll see why after I do that. So draw my rotation arrow there, a little loop in it. And notice on the right, everything stayed the same. No rotation happened there. This is where the change started to happen. So now the carbonyl is now outside. And then we have the O. And then I'm drawing out the bond of the H. And notice I can make this, um, if I kind of put a dotted line to outline what I just made here. It looks almost like a little hexagon or benzene ring. This is a six-membered ring transition state. These so-called aromatic transition states are um, sort of justification for why this mechanism uh, is likely the most plausible. Now, how is this an aromatic transition state? Because it's going to be pushing arrows in a cyclic fashion. So let's show how that's done. Why did I put that H next to the O? Because the electrons from this pi bond are going to go grab that, that uh, H. Because in order for this to leave as CO2, it's got to get rid of the H. So it's going to give that H to that O. So here we go. Takes that H. Then it leaves its electrons here because CO2 has a C double bond O. And in order for this carbon to accept those electrons, it must break the bond to the carbon and it can make it as a pi bond there. So see that? That's a cyclic six-membered ring aromatic transition state. Now let's draw the, this is the best part. This is the really important clincher because everything up to here was repeat. It's like a rerun. This was the new, most important part of the mechanism. So we really got to take our time to understand this piece. So if we're going to draw the result of this now, this is gone. This bond is broken. There's a pi bond, a CC pi bond between these two carbons. I'm going to start here. I'm going to draw a carbon with the methyl and ethyl and draw a CC uh, alkene. Methyl ethyl. Okay, so that's this part. And then that double bond on the other side has an OH, because remember that's what this arrow said, OH, and another OH. So a geminal diol. That means an OH on the same carbon. Plus, right here is where the CO2 formed. I'm actually going to use my highlighter tool for that. So see right here, that's that was all CO2. So that separated from the rest of the molecule. All those atoms that are not yellow are on that parent molecule now. And this is the most rewarding part. Something feels good about doing that. <laughs> Just, I guess, because I know it's thermodynamically and entropically favorable. All right, so we are at this point, but this does not look like that. But good news, this is an enol. So what do we do with enols? That's right, to tomorize. Now, if you're going to tomorize, that means one of these two oxygens becomes a carbonyl. And you could keep the other one the way it is. We lose that pi bond. Now we are home free. This is just a simple flip over, and this is this. So we proved our whole mechanism here. Okay, so yes, that's a doozy, Just it, and it's just really that step. So you know hydrolysis, but this is one that I recommend. Just kind of get another little card or something and sketch this down and kind of redo this one over and over again. I would say even from here, where you have to rotate and get it lined up. And push these arrows and get it to here. So this this piece 
It's kind of the important one. And we're going to do it one more time with another specific reaction sequence once again. So we really broke that mechanism down into lots of pieces. You want to be able to kind of stand back and say, hey, if I was told I need to use that melonic ester synthesis, would I know even how to begin? So what if you're told, hey, um, show the forward synthesis for this final target? So you know you had to start with a melonic ester. How would you make this? So first you'd have to know what the melonic ester was. So oftentimes that's given to you, but not always, but it's the diester that shares an alpha carbon. So it's really not that hard to remember. Okay, but remember, you have to lose one of these to CO2. You have to do a double hydrolysis. You have to get R groups on here, one or two. Now notice that this piece here, let's find the alpha carbon, alpha. This has been bonded to the alpha carbon, and this has been bonded to the alpha carbon. Those are your R groups. I think we have enough information now. So go step one, base, N-A-O-E-T, to make your enolate. Step two, pick either one of those R groups. I'm going to pick the red one. It's a purple bromide. Get that one on step three. Alkylate a second time, but this time I'll do the blue one. Finally, hydrolysis conditions, double hydrolysis decarboxylation. And we're done. It's those five steps. Okay, and a very similar one that you're also responsible for knowing is um, the acetoacetic ester synthesis. <laughs> it's so similar that it's easy and hard because they could be confused. So look at what we're making. We're making the same thing, one R group or two R groups. Instead of having a carboxylic acid, we have a ketone. And it's the same reagents. You could either do that three step, deprotonate, alkylate, hydrolyze, and decarboxylate, or deprotonate, alkylate, deprotonate, alkylate, hydrolyze, and decarboxylate to end up with one R group on there or two R groups. But notice here, it's a ketone instead of a carboxylic acid, all right? So it's actually a shorter mechanism because it's not a diester. So that you only do the hydrolysis one time because you can't hydrolyze a ketone. So just point that out. That's the only difference is that it's not a diester. So ethyl acetoacetate is useful if you need a ketone instead of the carboxylic acid when you're done. Okay, so let's write that down. I'm gonna do it a different color. Ketone. Okay, so circle that, this is the ketone on one side and ester on the other side. This is the one that went off as CO2. It's gone. You have no choice. You have to hydrolyze that one. And then let's dissect this some more. We get a new R group from here, right? We could have gotten two of them, but we got one because I'm just showing the first step. All right, so it's pretty straightforward. I think it's identical and personally to the other one, uh, but I'm going to cover it and hopefully this will at least serve as review if nothing else. Um, to kind of cement the other one as well at the same time. Um, we're going to do work this out stepwise. So we're going to form the enolate. How do we form an enolate? We deprotonate. So always the alpha carbon has an alpha H. Notice I'm not symmetric anymore. On the other side, I have a ketone. So how did that come off? My lone pairs on my base took off. Oops, I didn't draw my H. There's my alpha H's. There we go. Step two, alkylation. So the pr previous product. 
So you can draw the methyl out if you want, or just write ME or write CH3, either way. But SN2, and here we go. Ethyl on there now. All right, so once again, you could move on to the very end and hydrolyze, decarboxylate, or you can add another R group. So just for completion, I'm going to show both uh, enolate formations. So product of the previous step. And we have our alpha H is going to come off. Take that off. We leave behind the electrons. And there's our enolate. Our nucleophile ready to attack another R group. So hence second. Oh, I was doing that in blue, wasn't I? Let's go back to blue. Second, alkylation. Previous product has the enolate ready to attack. There we go. SN2. Ethyl, methyl. Really straightforward. Now we're going to get to here. Step five. In my opinion, the best part because it's the new, only really new thing. Hydrolysis of the ester and decarboxylation. And I just really think the rotating to the six member burden transition state is super cool. So um, we're going to do it again. And it's hard, so it's worth, uh, it's worth doing more than once. Good practice. OK, we have to have the ester on one side. We have a methyl, ethyl. And then the other side had a ketone. Otherwise, it really looks like the previous one. And without that ester, it's going to look like this. Right? So we can draw that product. So if you had to do that instead of doing the mechanism, you would be able to predict that product. Now let's go ahead and start our mechanism. Now I am going to kind of do it the same way I did before. Old hat, or I'm just going to call this H+. And I'm going to activate a carbonyl. Any carbonyl? Let's draw my lone pairs on. No, not any carbonyl. I'm not going to activate this carbonyl. There's no point. It stays. It doesn't get hydrolyzed. It's the ketone. I've got to activate this one because that's the one that's got to get hydrolyzed. And the previous one both got hydrolyzed, so it didn't matter. This one, I could only activate that one. So I only drew both lone pairs on there to try to get you to think about it. Okay, where'd you go? Come get it. And activated carbonyl. All right, activated, ready for attack. Water is our nucleophile, always for hydrolysis. Attack, open. Open to an alcohol, ETO, O with its two H's from the water. And then all of this are spinach coming off. Okay, this is our glorious proton transfer step that allows us to shortcut to a, I wouldn't say shortcut because it is an allowed step, fast track, if you will, um, to an ethanol leaving group. So we need ethanol to be ready to leave because that's not in our final product. And remember, we're gonna get a geminal diol just like the previous one. And there's our ketone on the other side. 
Okay, remember to get the ethanol to leave. We use a lone pair on one of the alcohols as a driving force to kick it down and reform a carbonyl because we know we have a carbonyl in the end anyway, so we might as well reform it now as well as kick off the leaving group. There's our uh, carboxylic acid formation, or at least the beginnings of it. Okay, let's neutralize that. And we are at that point where we can kind of pause and reflect. We finished the one and only hydrolysis. We do not do double hydrolysis because there's not a second ester to hydrolyze. So we don't do a repeat. And that sense it's shorter. We don't even have to write repeat. That would be wrong because we can't. We're going to go straight to rotate, which I can't do with that arrow. So let's draw the right arrow. Here we go. I'm going to rotate this around there. And have, let's fix that. There we go. Okay, so notice I have the right side, once again, kind of stays the same. I don't know why I actually do like to keep the right side the same. Maybe it's different for different handed folks. Uh, so keep that there, and then I have my carbonyl pointing out now instead, my oxygen. And remember the goal is to draw out that bond so we can approach a six-membered ring transition state. I'm going to box this in again. This is not an official thing. This is just to kind of show you that we, if we encased it all, we would see a six-membered ring. And we see that more obviously when we push the arrows that are about to come, these cyclic arrows. So protonate that oxygen with its own pi bond electrons to grab that H. The H leaves its electrons behind to form one of the CO double bonds of CO2, which forces the CO2 to leave, which is what we want it to do, by breaking its bond to that carbon, giving those electrons to form the CC pi bond. So I'll highlight my CO2 again, if that helps. Here's my CO2. All right, so let's draw CO2 plus our methyl and ethyl on the pi bond and a geminal dial. I feel like I did something wrong. There's not a geminal dial. I remember reading that from last time. So let's look through this mechanism. Uh, pi bond has a methyl and an ethyl. Pi bond has a methyl and an ethyl. Carbon on the other side has a methyl and an alcohol. Yeah, not a geminal dial. A methyl and alcohol. Now it's good. Oh yes, this is our keto, our enol form, and we need it to tautomerize it. So we're about to draw the keto over here, which means we have the OH becomes carbonyl with the methyl, so ketone. And there is our final product that matches the one we came up with before. Great. So if we had to do the opposite, propose a synthesis, we can do that, just like we did before. Now, you might say, I don't know, this is going to be confusing. There's an acetoacetic ester synthesis and a malonic ester synthesis. How do I know the difference? Well, look at what you're being asked to make. A doubly alkylated methyl ketone. That's an acetoacetic ester synthesis. If there was a carboxylic acid here, it would be a malonic ester. Okay. All right, so I'm going to highlight some of the key features. So methyl ketone from the acetoacetic ester. We have these two R groups. This is R1. I'll call this one R2. 
Okay, so the acetoacetic ester has an ester on one side that shares an alpha carbon with the methyl ketone. We get in there and we have five steps because we have two R groups. So deprotonation one, alkylation one. So I, I chose alkylation one to be the green circle, which is a propyl group. Deprotonation two, so we repeat that. Alkylation two, I chose that to be the blue group. And then finally, of course, H3O plus for hydrolysis and heat. Okay, so these are very specific alkylation conditions. And I want to just point out that this whole idea of decarboxylation, I'm going to make a little note here. Let's go back to this for a second. How do we know this will happen? Because we could have just said um, hey this looks like a pretty good product right here why can't we stop there that's a carboxylic acid on one carbon and a ketone on the other why does it keep going so I'm going to describe a feature that allows it to do this six membered ring transition state so let's number it one two three so it's a 1,3-dicarbonyl, and one of the carbonyls is part of a carboxylic acid. We had a 1, 2, 3. A 1,3-dicarbonyl with one carbonyl equals CO2H. Therefore, so it's not just special about malonic ester or acetoacetic ester. We could just take a 1,3-dicarbonyl that has one of the carbonyls part of a carboxylic acid, heat it up, and we will get decarboxylation. That means we'll lose the CO2. Okay, I will drive that off. So I'm just gonna highlight that there because that is not unique to this. That is just the, an official capacity with which it's introduced to you, but you will likely see it in other types of problems. Okay. Let's look at the one more type of alkylation and just review the kinds we've covered. We've covered different ways to alkylate. So we've done this acetoacetic ester synthesis so we're going to ask ourselves why go through this complicated starting material versus just taking LDA and alkylating it over and over again. So let's let's look at that, okay? All right. So take this is acetone basically. LDA THF -78 degrees we're going to make the enolate. So I'm going to draw it this way now. Okay? And then we can draw the lone pairs. And it can come and attack and kick that off SN2. So we can extend our carbon chain. We alkylated it. Let's compare it to the method below. Deprotonate, alkylate. What does that look like? Hydrolyze, that means we lose this whole thing. Hey, these are the same. Two ways to get the same product. Which way is better? Well, one thing I didn't draw here, what's the hard part here? It's hard to make an enolate because we're making a charged species. And notice this, so let's compare the hard part, the enolate step. Notice that it's resonance stabilized in both cases, but this one has more resonance. So 
so this is actually the better way to make this particular product, the alkylated product. So so second method is better because the enolate's resonant stabilized. Okay, so that's why even though it looks kind of funny to start with such a specifically odd starting material, um, it actually isn't that odd because by having a 1,3-dicarbonyl with uh, this being our alpha carbon, it makes it much more acidic, super easy to make, as opposed to this, much less acidic. So super good enolate, which makes this a very useful synthetic pathway for alkylation. So this, this stuff just gets removed later as CO2. Okay, so practice, 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 and I hope that helped clear up some of the um, mechanism arrow pushing, and I will reconvene with you to cover aldol. <laughs>